So this week on A Fighter's Life, I am joined by founder and president of Matchroom Sport, Mr. Barry Hearn. Now, of course, he's famous for starting Matchroom, for snooker, golf, boxing. But these days, he's probably most famous for being Eddie Hearn's dad. Now, of course, we're going to chat about Eddie. So I thought, let me message Eddie, all right, see if I can get a really cool question to put to Barry, something that you might not have heard before, something that's personal between father and son. But instead, I got a big fat, read mark like he saw it and he just aired me so i kind of got mugged off by eddie but it's all right barry's here to tell us all the stories about his own life and the boxing world it's a fighter's life when i made some money in 1982 i bought a few things my mum came to see the house i'd built you want your parents to be proud of you don't you she looked around it and she looked at me and she said are you doing anything illegal Barry Hearn, welcome to A Fighter's Life. No, oh, thank you. That's a pleasure to be here, my friend. I've got to say, Barry, I'm, um, I said it to you off, off mic earlier, and you were like, oh, shut up, you're lying. This has been the one. I've, I've been really excited for this, you know, because I'm a bit of a boxing nerd. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm a limited edition, that's for sure. <laughs> and, of course, I'm getting to that stage where you never know. I'm getting loads of awards at the moment. You know, isn't it interesting? I'm 75 now, been in the business 45 years, and suddenly I get, I've got four Hall of Famers now in four wow. different sports, which no one has ever got in the world. What are these four sports? Well, boxing, I got inducted into the Boxing Hall of, International Boxing Hall of Fame, the Billiard Congress of America for Paul, the World Snooker Hall of Fame, and of course the Darts Hall of Fame. Yeah. So, I'm, but I just think they give you these awards because they don't know how long you're going to live for. Oh, and, Barry. <laughs> and they don't, they don't want to feel guilty that if you die before they give you something. So it's a bit like you speaking to me today, you know, what on earth? <laughs> Limited edition, yeah, but you're really doing it because you think, I might get a few gems out of Bazza and he might not be here tomorrow, so just get him today. <laughs> Do you know what? That is, I mean, it's a cynical way of putting it. But it's but best, I know what you mean. I know it, what you yeah, mean. It's the best thing in life is if, if you don't expect anything, mm -hmm. everything is a bonus. Yeah. So if you take things for granted, you're less of a person. If you don't appreciate that it's out of your hands, then you have no beliefs. So all of these coupled together means that we're all free spirits, aren't we? And that's, that's the precious thing about life because it's the one thing you can't do a spreadsheet on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I hear that. This is, this is why I was excited to have you on, my Barry, because everybody that I've got to speak to on this podcast is, of course, you still have skin in the game, right? But Matrim is such a gigantic company now mm. eddie's on the the boxing side of stuff quite a lot of course you're still across yeah, yeah. it but it's kind of one of those things where you're in a position now where you you can kind of half take a step back and say it how it is you can be honest barry right uh, where I, a lot of people I've can't been be like, i've been like that for a number of years to be fair but and sometimes to my great disadvantage <laughs> you know i mean i'm now banned officially banned by my son from, <laughs> from attending boxing meetings on the grounds that if i hear something i don't like I just sling them out. Really? I don't care who they are. And Eddie's trying to do a deal and he's like, no, Dad, no, no, don't go down that road. So I can understand it. Look, boxing is a messy business. It's a highly complicated business because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with people's lives, you're dealing with their futures and their children and the safeguarding their future. But it's also a mess mm -hmm. because it's so money orientated and, and there are so many people in it that, Come under that category of what I call fur coat, no knickers. Yeah. You know, they've got all the ideas in the world. But when it comes up to putting the dough up, suddenly there's an empty seat in the room, you know. So you've got to be careful who you're dealing with. And there are only a few, a very few reputable people in the business. I like to think that Matram is the most reputable because, as you say, we're no longer a boxing business. We're a global company now. I mean, look, we started Matram in 82. I did. Uh, underneath a billiard hall in Romford with me and a girl. And the idea was, let's have some fun. I, you know, I'd made a few quid. I was 34 years old. I was going to retire. I'd made a, you know, a couple you, of quid. You, you, you don't know what? You could go, I could retire. No, in 82, I could retire. Jesus. And I thought, I'm 34. Because I come from a council house background, and I'm very, I am still very working class. Get, get back, can, I'm not sure, can you tell us about that, mate? Well, I mean, I'm so curious yeah, how you go from... I don't know how he got there, but I'm going to give most of the credit to my mum. She was a very ambitious woman. She was a char lady. She's a domestic cleaner. My dad was a bus driver. Okay. 
Yeah. But she wanted the best for her children. And her interpretation of the best was a bit snobbish. You know, <laughs> I was 11. She sent me to elocution lessons. Oh, really? She was on it. I mean, the one thing that taught me was how to fight. <laughs> because everyone took the piss out of me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> And then the year after, she enrolled me in the Amateur Dramatic Society. At 13, I was doing Bertolt Brecht plays and Shakespeare plays. And then I went into the verse speaking, a verse speaking society where I travelled to schools. I, I concentrated on T.S. Eliot and Robert Graves and people like that. And this was quite contrary to my background, but it was my mum's driving force to be the best you can be. Mm. And in her eyes, speaking nicely, knowing about the classics, knowing about... was her way of coming out of a working-class environment and being better. I don't think she was accurate in that way, by the way. <laughs> but it, looking back, it gave me... Now I look back and realise it helped to make me the person I am. It gave me a work ethic that is almost impossible to be. I mean, I'm known in the industry. I'm not the brightest candle in the room, but I burn longer than anyone. You can't beat me. It's impossible because I just won't accept defeat in any level. I do get beat, but it doesn't matter because I just throw that idea away and push on to the next positive approach. And I think she started that in me. And you know, we've all had to do a few things in our past that probably we didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. But the overriding principle for my mum was always to be a better person, to live a better life, to tell the truth, to be frightened of policemen, all these sort of <laughs> things, you know, which stick with you forever, don't they? You know, and she's probably made me what I am. And as I say, 82 came along. I'd, I'd had a successful career as a chartered accountant. I was obviously super smart or I convinced everyone I was super smart, probably more accurate. And I made some money when I sold all my billiardals. And at 34, I thought, that's it, because I had that working class. You know, I always tell fighters, first thing you do, pay off your mortgage. That's it. You know, it. Because when your career finishes, I want you to look back, hopefully with some pleasant memories, but more importantly with something that is valuable. You say, that house, boxing gave me that house or gave me that business. It has to, because boxing is a dinosaur sport that shouldn't be allowed in today's society, but it is. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have to appreciate use it for what it does and it takes people like me out of council houses and into mansions yeah but you have to be successful and you have to be prepared to sacrifice and, and pay the price which i've always done so for six weeks i retired i went fishing every day i played cricket i played golf i did what i always wanted to do and then after six weeks i was climbing up walls because i wasn't doing deals and i realized that was what i was born to do so i thought well I had a little snooker player called Steve Davis, who's been my best friend for 50 years now. And I said to him, why don't we just go out there and change the world? And we'll start off with snooker, which we did. And, and we laughed. We laughed every day. And that's the essence of the perfect life. Honestly, Barry, hearing that, it's it's a it's a it's a weird one, right? Because I am um... You can epitomize with that, I'm sure. You can, can. associate with that. You know, I knew your dad. Yeah. You know, and no, but you came from a very normal background. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. And but you have what I've seen of you, even looking on the television or looking at things you do, is a consummate professional. And that is not you're not born to do that. You've worked on it. You've made your sacrifices, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's only right. The man upstairs looks down and says, "This kid deserves a break." Do you know what, Barry? I, I, I talked to you, right? It's funny because <clears throat> we've had a few people on the podcast and I'm a big fan of boxing, so I'm massively mm. interested in the characters. But I I get laughed at quite a lot by my mates, right? Because I'm more interested in... If AJ's got a fight on, I'm more interested at watching an interview that IFL will catch with you ringside. Mm. I like hearing how it's happened, why it's happened, what's the plan, knowing people who are going to be honest, who are not going to be honest. I, I like that side of it, right? Mm. And being a, as big a fan of you and Eddie as I am of Canelo and AJ, mate, if you're not a big fan of the sport, I think some people find that a little bit confusing. So I am super excited to have you on the podcast. And you're giving us an overview of kind of, like even what you've said there, your mindset, where it's come from, it's come from your mum. But if you go from the 11 year old boy who's doing elocution lessons and then 13 doing plays and doing Shakespeare and this and that, how did you apply that to business and then grow it to where it mm. is before I, you even got to match room? 
When I was 12, my mum came home from the bloke whose house she cleaned and said, when you grow up, you're going to be a chartered accountant. <laughs> and I said, am I? She said, yes. And you didn't argue with my mum. <laughs> I said, what do they do? She said, I haven't got a clue. She <laughs> said, but the man whose house I cleaned told me, and this is the quote that drove me through my teenage years, you never see a poor one. <laughs> now, whilst I was never jealous of what other people had, I was envious to the point that I wanted the same or more. And I realised early doors, you know, I mean, I was 18 years in council house. I was happy. It didn't, I wasn't unhappy. I've got no sad story about how my childhood, my childhood was perfectly happy. I was with a loving family, but I was encouraged to work from 12 or 13 years old. And I used to see the big houses on the top of the hill and question the world and say, why haven't I got one of them? Why haven't I got an indoor toilet? You know, things like that with a child. And when she told me, you never see a poor chartered account, that was it. As far as I was concerned, that was it. So every school teacher that said to me, it's careers class, I said, I don't need to go because I'm going to be a chartered accountant. And the reason was because you never see a poor one. That's what drove me. And then my mother's work ethic that she installed on me meant it was impossible for me to ever fail an exam of any description because from age 18 to 21, she virtually locked me in my bedroom every night, Monday to Friday. I never went out. Really? And she said, study, learn. I wouldn't say I understood what I was reading, but I could recite page after page from memory. Mm -hmm. So it was impossible to fail an exam, which was <laughs> handy because I couldn't afford to take it twice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, 21, I was qualified, one of the youngest chartered accountants. 25, I was, I think, the youngest ever fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. I've been there for 50 years now. I, I pride myself on my qualification and the integrity that it installed in me. Uh, and that's the serious side of my life. And so, you know, going off to work for a major firm, I get headhunted by a fashion company in the mid seventies to be their finance director. They put me in charge of looking at other opportunities. God decided to make a phone call one day and said, are you interested in the chain of snook rules? I went there within six months, the BBC put snooker on mainstream television. Wow. Everyone told me I was a genius. I was just lucky, but I, I agreed with them. I said, yes. <laughs> and then I'm sitting in the billiard hall one day and the phone goes and it's the manager's upstairs and he says, there's a kid up here you should come and have a look at. So I'm like bored. I wasn't really working very hard in those days. So I went up there and I saw this tall ginger kid. You know, he didn't open his mouth, you know, had a hole in his jumper, I seem to remember. Long ginger hair, and he was from South London, which, as you know, is a no-go area. Yeah. Um, but I was impressed with his dedication and his focus. And in a way, I saw a bit of me about that because I've always been very focused on what I want to achieve. Even now, you know, I have plans all the time. You know, I mean, I don't stop 24 hours a day because it's my life, you know. And I saw that in him, and we created a friendship. He became the best player in the world. I became the manager of the best player of the world. This is what makes me laugh about boxing in particular. I mean, Eddie's number one in the world, global boxing. But you know what? You're only there because of the talent you represent. Mm -hmm. So you could, be a you could be the number one boxing promoter in the world tomorrow if you had half a dozen of the top fighters. Whether you knew what you were doing is irrelevant. But, in, uh, but I it's guess all about the talent. Isn't it staying there, though, Barry? Because to well, get it to him, Eddie, Eddie's yeah, incredible listen, what he does. No, right? no, listen, Eddie's, oh, I'm, I'm biased because I love my son, as every dad would, you know, and you want the best for him. But see, I have no fear of death because I have Eddie. And he just sounds like me, looks like me, talks no, like it's me. It's weird. It's like looking at a time machine. I you mean, too. and he nicks on my quotes anyway. He does, yeah, you know I what? Mean, fur coat, no, uh, fur coat, fur, no gigs. That's, that's what him. I heard him oh, say no, the other no, last I week. Mean, every time, I mean, I was the only boxing promoter that quoted Voltaire. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's doing it, you know. So th this is what I want to ask, right, Barry? You're at, you're at, you're at a stage where you're a chartered accountant. You've you've broke records to youngest, uh, youngest ever chartered accountant. You're doing... You've achieved your life goals that were kind of set on you and what you kind of feel like you really wanted by the time you're, you're 25, 30. So at, 
Then you, you see, have to take another level, you see. And that's what I'm asking. Yeah, what yeah. made you... What when you, It's just you, in you. It's in you. I mean, when I made some money in 1982, which is when I retired for six weeks, I bought a few things, uh, nice things. And my mum came to see the house I'd built, I bought. And I was so excited for it to come. I think... You want your parents to be proud of you, don't you? My you dad do. died very early, so it was me and my mum, really. And she came to this house. And it's, it's big. And she looked around it, and she looked at me, and she said, are you doing anything illegal? Really? <laughs> and, I, and that is where I understood, sometimes you have to go use people's dreams to get to a certain level, and then you have to create your own dreams to go to the next level. And 82 was the start of me creating my own dreams. I wanted to be a sports promoter to achieve lots of different things, but most of them are semi-legacy related. So with snooker, I saw a sport I fell in love with. I saw a player who developed as a friend, and I wanted to take it to the world. So I went off around the world doing that. You know, I probably wasn't the best husband. I probably wasn't the best father at those days mm -hmm. because my focus was on achieving goals. And when you focus on achieving something, you can't have any interruptions to that. Yeah. And you have to be quite brutal with yourself and with other people sometimes. So I was creating then my own dreams and then it developed. I used to, I mean, I wasn't, listen, your dad would have beat me up every day of the week. <laughs> I, I was terrible as a fighter, but I used to love it. Yeah. I love one-to-one -one confrontation, even when I get beat, because there's no excuses and I don't like excuses. My only excuse is I'm not good enough. And I always put my hand up and I tell sportsmen when they get beat, don't look in the mirror. Don't blame your manager. Don't blame your promoter. Don't blame your trainer. You weren't good enough. Once you've accepted that, then you're ready to move to the next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when we find out about the character in sportsmen. Sometimes a defeat can be the trigger for your next big advance. Sometimes it's the end of you. Yeah. It just depends on the personality and the character that you've got. So for me, once my mother's dreams, if you like, once I qualified, she was just made up, you know, she cried. For days, oh, well so happy. Yeah. Then she didn't really understand the world I was going. The comment, you know, doing it, Mum, I'm a chartered accountant. Look it up. Never see a poor one. <laughs> Never see a poor one. But they make terrible gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I can see where how much we started in terms of you know you you, you bought the halls, then you've kind of moved into snooker. Why boxing? How did, I, how did because you make that? I'd always been a fight fan. From age seven, I decided I wanted to be heavyweight champion of the world. So I would be underneath my bed clothes at two o'clock in the morning with one of those little dodgy plastic transistor radios, listening to the crackling commentary. I can remember, I think the first fight I ever listened to, like at three o'clock in the morning, was Rocky Marciano wow. against, it'll come to me. And I wasn't, yeah, Archie Moore. And, and actually, about four years later, I can remember listening to Muhammad Ali fighting Archie Moore as well. <laughs> I think that was the first Ali fight I ever listened to. And, you know, you used to go to Saturday morning pictures with your sixpence and you'd sit there watching rubbish. But I used to wait for Pathé News because mm -hmm. it always had a clip about someone's won the bo heavyweight boxing or light heavyweight boxing. And they became my heroes because I identified with them as the way out of where I was. Mm -hmm. Later on, I realised the only way out was to work very hard and work harder than everybody else. I understood. But at the time, boxing was a, an escape vehicle from people where I came from. You know, if you look at boxing, yeah. it's always Cardiff, Glasgow, London, Manchester, Liverpool. You know, areas that had a lot of poor people in, mm -hmm that wanted to change their lives. And boxing is that conduit to change your life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in one night, it can change your life. It's the only sport that can do that. But when I found out that I wasn't very good, it was a bit of a career setback, <laughs> but I still retain my passion for boxing. So I would, you know, I, I mean, I was still sparring when I was 47, you know, and I just liked it. You know, I didn't do it every day then, but, you know, I used to get beat up by most people. I just liked it. I don't put them... But I always thought that the fighters had a bad deal. And I always thought that the standard of entertainment from the old-time promoters was shit. 
You know, <laughs> yeah. the matchmaking was... I mean, I was there one night, the night of the Mexican road sweep, as they called it. Mm. It was Royal Albert Hall. It was a Mickey Duff show. There was five first-round knockouts, and I don't think any of these Mexicans had ever had a fight in their life. Right. They'd been shipped in for $500, got a good idea, and went home. Yeah. And I thought to myself, do you know, you can do better than this. Mm-hmm. Why don't you give punters fights they want to see and... You know, and obviously give opportunity to youngsters to achieve their dreams, but at, at a higher level, not to use them. Yeah, I think that in the old days, the fighters worked for promoters. Yeah, my favourite is what we've got today, where the promoters work for the fighters. Barry, I've got to ask you this, mate. <clears throat> when you think back to when you first moved in mm. to boxing, did you ever think that you'd be hearing figures of? Yeah, but we've got an offer from oh. Saudi for a hundred million. No, no, it's no. it's insane, right? I, I sat down. I did a couple of little fights with Terry Lawless, uh, uh, Cliffs Pavilion, South End. Yeah, with Gary Mason. Best <laughs> in soul. Rest in soul. Rest in peace. And I got the bug. I can tell you now. The first fight made six hundred and thirty-seven pound profit, and the second fight lost five thousand one hundred and eighteen. Wow! I'm a numbers man. Yeah. That doesn't make me a bad person. It makes me a real person because we've all got to pay our bills and we've got to try and create sustainable businesses. If you don't make a profit, you don't do that. So I'm not there to be one of the fur coat, no knickers brigade. But then I thought I was sitting down, funny enough, in a Chinese restaurant in South End. And my wife is my best friend in a way. 53 years with the same woman. It's a long time or more. 53 years married. And she's very hard. She's old school East End. Mm-hmm. And I was talking about, I think I'll get into boxing. And she sort of rub, was rubbishing me, you know. You, <laughs> what, you, what do you know about promoting boxing? I said, I'll tell you what I do know is I know fights people want to see. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, give me an example. I said, Frank Bruno against Joe Boogan. It just came out. I said, like, everyone loves Frank Bruno. He's the nation's favourite on BBC. Everyone hates Joe Boogner because... He beat Henry Cooper in a disputed decision and such like. I said, that's showbiz. That boxing needs showbiz. And that fight sells. She said, yeah, well, I'd like to see the day you've... you." I said, well, hang on a second. I left. This is a gospel true story. When you're 75, by the way, don't tell lies. I bet you don't, Barry. You're, you're too close to God. You, <laughs> yeah. And then you will remember, <laughs> you know? So I went out to the reception and the woman, Chinese lady there, lovely lady, I said, can I use your phone? And she said, yeah, she thought I was phoning a taxi. I phoned Melbourne, Australia. And this little squeaky voice said, hello? Because Joe Bugner spoke like that. (laughs) I said, Joe, you don't know me. My name's Barry Hearn. I said, I'll do do a bit on the snooker. I've heard the name, mate. What can I do for you? I said, I've got a fight for you. Really? Now, he was on the tail end of his career. I said, I want you to fight Frank Bruno in London. He went, well, it's going to cost you a lot of money. I went... I think you got $10,000 for your last fight, Joe. I said, but I'll give you £250,000 to come over and fight Frank Bruno. And he went quiet and then he said, and what plane did you want me on? (laughs) And then the following two two or three, no, I had one done. And then two or three days later, I had nothing. I had no idea what I was doing. Tim Witherspoon was supposed to fight Joe, uh, Frank Bruno. And he, he withdrew with a bad back. Which was predictable because I think he was there to do his shopping, really. Yeah. He wasn't going to fight Frank. So I got hold of Frank in the middle of, well, late night, got him round his manager's house and said, here's a contract. Do you want to fight Joe Bugner? And of course, he had connection. I was breaking all the rules because he had a contract with other yeah, people yeah. and all that. He said, I've got a fight. I'm trained. I'm ready to fight. I said, yeah, it's 300 grand. Do you want it or not? And he signed. <laughs> and, then, and, and it just went from there I sort of tumbled into thinking where should I do it I used to go to Tottenham I was on Orient support and still am all my life but I used to go to Tottenham for the double in 61, 62 so it's a soft spot for me Tottenham Oxford so I went to see the, the owners and did a deal and then I thought wow well, bloody hell what am I going to do for television I went to see the BBC thinking it was a shoe in they turned the fight down Unbelievably, because they didn't like me, really, because I was a new boy on the block. Mm-hmm. So I went to see Greg Dyke at London Weekend Television, who he was a bit of a revolutionary in his day. I, I remember going to the South Bank offices and said, can you put me through to Mr. Dyke? And this bloke picked up the phone and said, Dyke, I said, look, you don't know me. I'm Barry Hearn. I do a bit of snooker. Yeah, I've heard of you, Barry. I said, I've got a boxing fight for you. He said, oh, we're looking at boxing. He said, next time you're in London, give me a shout. We'll get together. I said, I'm downstairs. <laughs> 
He said, well, you better come upstairs. And we went upstairs and he said to me, what do you want? I said, I want 200 grand. And he said, I don't think you can deliver this fight. I said, my name's Barry Earn. I always deliver. He said, if you can deliver, I'll give you 250 instead of 200. To this day, the only person that's ever offered me more oh, money than I asked for. Yeah. And we got 18.7 million viewers. Wow. And in a way, it was great because I made a load of money. I cut the other lot in as well. I didn't upset too many people. Um, so everyone had a touch. And I loved it. I loved it. I love the atmosphere, you know. I, I don't know how long you got on this podcast. No, mate, right? please. Well, I just, not, can I'm... you imagine that here's this kid, loved boxing all my life, always thought I could do things with my life. I always thought there's no barriers to entry. I hate barriers to entry. Just give me a level playing field. Then I know I'll win. And I'm sitting there on the night of the fight and I haven't got a Scooby-Doo what I'm doing. And I thought, what do I do now? We're coming up to the main event. And I remember an old Mickey Rooney black and white film where he was a boxing manager and he went in the dressing room to see both fighters. I thought, if it's good enough for Mickey Rooney, good it's on. good enough for me. <laughs> so I went in Frank's dressing room. It was like a morgue. No one was talking. It was horrible. The atmosphere was terrible. I just went, best of luck, Frank, and left. <laughs> Struck out. And then I went down Joe Bugner's dressing room and I could hear the music. Now, bear in mind that Joe Bugner had fought Muhammad Ali, mm. he fought Joe Fraser. This wasn't going to phase him. Yeah. No, he was there for the money anyway. I opened the door and he was, hello, Barry. I said, hey, he's got a great night, mate. <laughs> I said, listen, i just got to say thanks. I said, you've sold this show. You've gone to press conferences with the Aussie hat on with the corks. <laughs> you've, 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 walked, you've taken a, a blown-up crocodile into a, a, a media centre, you know. <laughs> you've really sold the tickets. I said, I just want to say thanks because I don't know what I'm doing anyway. I said, but I will tell you this. If you can win tonight, I will pay you a fortune to come back and fight this new kid in America that I'm hearing that's quite good. His name is Mike Tyson. <laughs> and Joe Bugner looked at me and said, well, Barry, he said, you're paying me a lot of money and I want to say thank you. He said, but I'll say one thing. If he hurts me, I'm going down. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit, he's not going to try at all. <laughs> but fortunately, Frank clipped him in the eighth round, so everyone had their money back. But it, it was creating an occasion mm. rather than just putting on a fight that excited me. So we started, we really invented the big entrances. and all that. Even if the fight was shit, yeah. people like can still get value. I mean, a lot of Eubanks fights weren't spectacles in the ring, but the build-up, the entrance, the monocle, the jodfers, the, yeah, it was just simply the best being somebody. It, everyone left with a smile on their face, feeling they had value for money. And that was what I wanted to bring to sport. And that idea has kept me going for 45 years in sport because I take the same attitude everywhere. I've got to make a profit. I'm a businessman and I love making profits because that's my game. I'm not in the sport. My game is to do better than last year, yeah. which I've managed to do for 31 consecutive years. And it's a, it's a, I feel good about it. It doesn't mean anything, but I feel good myself. Yeah. But also, you get the opportunity to change people's lives to give them opportunity. So if you take a sport like darts, we started off as 500,000 dollars prize money for the whole year today it's over 20 million wow. and we've changed people's lives and kids coming from the same area that i come from happen to be good at dance and now have changed their lives so that gives me a warm feeling but also a warm feeling that it's a hugely successful and profitable business yeah. at the same time but we've all got to eat yeah. rockefeller yeah, yeah. once said every deal is possible if everyone ends up with a bit of bread in their mouth and that's the best way you can approach promoting sport so Barry you, you you glossed over it earlier and you said something that you were like I might not have been the best husband or father in those times and it was a it was a quote in Eddie's book which is probably a quote isn't it from you that mm. if you want to be successful you have to be selfish to a certain degree it's, it's just totally honestly have you read my book it's much better than his book <laughs> <laughs> the, the, big, the big thing about it is no you see his book he's got like you, he's got millions of social media followers. It's not a fair fight, is it? It's me. I mean, you know. So I take three and a half years writing my life story. The reason being, my daughter had twin boys, and she's a very sensitive girl, and she said, you've got to write your book. And I said, I really, 
I've got to wait for a few more people to die yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, three of them did by the time I, you know, while I was oh writing my book. So that was okay. But it was important for me to get it right and to try and explain, because it was a legacy book. I didn't write it for the public. I wrote it for these two young kids. Nice. Because I want them to understand why they've got drug habits and ride around in Ferraris because <laughs> I've completely ruined their life, right? And hopefully they can read parts of the book that say there's another way to go, which is the whole point of my book. However, Eddie wrote his book in about three and a half minutes <laughs> with, with a ghostwriter. And it, listen, it was okay. But of course, he, his advance was like four times mine because he's Eddie Hearn. <laughs> he sold four, four times more copies because he's got social media followers. And I keep saying, the only thing that keeps me going, and there was one review which said, in comparison, Eddie Hearn's book is a comic, whilst Barry Hearn's is a classic. Oh, And man. that's the only thing that keeps me having half a decent Sunday lunch with him. Because <laughs> otherwise, in my family, we kill each other. Yeah. You know, the banter is like merciless, relentless. relentless. But, you know, that, those are the sort of things, that, you know, when you say about the stages of life, which Eddie referred to quite rightly in his book, and it's not that bad book, you know, it's just not as good as mine. <laughs> but there are stages, and I've tried to explain to youngsters that I talk to and say, look, that make you a bad person. There's, 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 we all get an opportunity where we come from to go down one road or the other, and we're guided generally on the road. So in my case, my mother guided me on the good road. Mm -hmm. The bad road is much quicker, but it has serious pitfalls, mm -hmm. you know. So when you come to an age where you can actually ask yourself that question, what do I really want in life? I, I need to win. I don't care what it is. I've tried every single sport going, and I'm good at all of them, but I'm not great at any of them. And it kills me, you know. I give so much, you know. Gold medal enthusiasm, not even a bronze in ability. But it don't <laughs> stop me trying because yeah. the day you stop trying is the day you've just given up. And that doesn't feature. So when I look back now, and when you're 75, you do get quite reflective on your life. You have to be selfish. You have to just look after yourself. Because it's like when you get in an aeroplane. Do you know when they did that, that safety talk? Yeah. If we get experience cabin pressure, the oxygen mask falls down in front of you. What do you do with it? What's the instruction? You do yours first. Yeah. Because you can't help anyone else if you don't. Same in life. So selfishness to the point of view of you've got to find hopefully a good woman, or hopefully good children that understand dad's on a mission here. You ain't going to see as much of him as you might want. He's not going to be the normal dad. You know, ever so enthusiastic when I've got, but you come second. It's a terrible thing to say. Once you get to a certain stage of financial stability or credibility, then you can afford to be a much better dad and a much better husband. Mm -hmm. And then there's another stage where you've done that and you can now look at where you came from and put something back and actually that gives you unbelievably more pleasure than almost anything else. So you look at how can I help my community? Mm -hmm. How can I help people that trust me and have been in the same position as me some of them go down the wrong road. And we're never going to change the world, but if we can make a little dent in it, it helps. And there is a stage four where you can say, how can I help my country? Yeah. And there's a stage five where how can I help the world? Yeah, but yeah. other than Bill Gates and people like that, no, <laughs> no one gets to stage five. I'm quite happy at being at stage three. Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed to have a lovely family who I adore completely and... I don't have to apologise anymore for perhaps not being there. At certain. I wasn't there for my son's birth. Mm -hmm. Really? What, for Eddie's birth? Well, I was playing snooker. It was best of three. <laughs> oh, my God, Barry. No, but this, this, I might tell you, you want the truth or you want tell the Tell me the truth. Go on, what happened? My, I took my wife. She, uh, Walter's broke. I don't like all that sort of stuff. I'm an old school man, you know. Oh, children, all oh, women. Oh. <laughs> I mean, tremendous respect for them because mm. they do things I couldn't do. Took her to the hospital. I had a feeling, same as the one before, she was going to be in labour for hours and hours and hours and hours. I went to the snooker hall. I'm playing this geezer I'd never, I'd never beat him. We're playing for 50 quid, best of three. Hospital phone up. It's one all. 
She said, your wife's in the final stage of labour. I said, it's one all. She said, what does that mean? I said, I just got one more frame of snooker to play and I'll be there as quick as I can. Potted a lovely pink down the end, nicked a 50 quid, got up the hospital, missed it by 20 minutes. <laughs> She's <laughs> never, ever, ever forgiven me. But there is the man. And yeah. don't forgive me. Just understand what you got yourself involved in. And there's something else I wanted to ask about then looking at the past. Again, not to bring it up, because I know yours is better, Barry. But again, in Eddie's book, he says that he would wait for hours and hours when he heard your car pull up. Mm. You'd be in the office trying to work straight away. Dad, can we play a bit of cricket? Dad, can we? And you'd lay there. And he said that he learned a lot of lessons listening to you on the phone and doing this and doing that. He stood behind me for hours. Hours when he was eight and nine years old, listening to me having rows with Don King, Bob Arum, Frank Warren, whoever. Bad. And he was just, it, it went into him, you know. Mm. I mean, he, he's, he's a, look, he's a better operator now than I ever was. I'll tell you that. Do you but, believe that? Oh, no, I don't have to believe it. I'm, I, I'm factual in everything I say. He is, he comes at things from a different, it's another world today. And his attitude, I mean, he says it, and I'm not sure I'd have the cheek to say it because I do respect people in the industry who've been there a long time like me. But we are all dinosaurs. <laughs> Don King, Bob Aaron, Frank Warren, anyone else in the business. The old school, the old school. And we have got a lot of knowledge and we've got a lot of things and we know a lot of people and all that, which is a plus. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to building a business, no one has ever had the foresight or the intelligence or the backing because I back, you know, he's my son and whatever he wants is, you know, I back him because of what else you do with your kids. Um, but I've never seen anyone go global like this in boxing. But I feel like, Barry, that's quite down to you because I look at, I look at today, this day and age, right? And... So I've said I've always been a boxing fan. Mm. Since becoming a dad, mm. right, I've got three kids now. My outlook. Muzzle tov. What's that? Muzzle tov. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I wish I should have. I should have had more. I only had two. Really? The only mistake I've ever made in my life. I I look at I, I listen to certain things, and I try and take certain lessons because we're, we're all just trying to be the best parents we could be and whatsoever. Of course, of course. And there was a part in the book when he was like, "You'd go outside, you guys would play cricket. Didn't matter whether you was seven, eight, nine. 18, 19. I bowl flat out. Flat out at him. Absolutely. Flat. Is that true? Yeah. Why? You want to play with me? That's how you play. You do the best you can at every time. And it works both sides. I'm not going to give you a free ride. I play table tennis with Eddie's two girls. I have yet to be beaten. I try to beat. We play, eight, we play up to 11. Mm -hmm. We play lots of games. I would die rather than lose one of those games. And they, cry, <laughs> and they used to cry. Baza, what can't you give me? One, eleven nil, eleven nil, eleven nil. What? So, because one day, one day you will win a point, and that's an achievement. One day you will beat me, and I will tell you that day you're the better player. And in the meantime, you have to earn it. You're not getting given anything. Your life's already too much of a luxury. So, what do you think now, Barry? Because in this day and age, that mindset, like if I if I think about like my well, it's not it's not son, a modern mindset. It's like if I think about my five year old son, yeah. You're, this is, and I, it, sound, it sounds like I'm lying because you're here. I swear to God, I'm telling the truth, factually. Last year was my son's first sports day, right? He come last in every race he did. And it was because he did the first race, he got halfway up, he stopped, saw me and his mum. He's waving, smiling, <laughs> ran over for a hug part way through. And I'm there going, what are you doing? Go, go, go. My wife... Which just, she's got tears in her eyes because he noticed us. She's just like, oh, my boy, she's cuddling him partway through the race. I'm like, let him go, go, go. And afterwards, he was in the car coming home and he started crying. And he was like, um, he's got these two little friends. And he was like, oh, Tommy said I came last. And I'm like, horrible. I was like, you did. And my wife like, elbowed me. I was like, shut up. And I'm like, but he, he lost, right? And it's a really difficult one That's trying difficult. to find yeah, that yeah, line yeah, because the fact is, I was like, if you would have ran fast and you would have concentrated, you would have done a lot better. Right, and I said that, and I know he's super young now, right? Yeah, but put it in his mind. Which is what I was trying to do. And uh, but everyone else did it. No, not everyone, but know, every, my mum, no. my, my missus, look, everyone think, disagrees with me. Look, I'm giving you a summary of how I am, but of course there are times you put your arm around them, don't you? Mm -hmm. And you have a little cry with them. That doesn't hurt. You tell them the truth. And it will hurt them earlier days in their life. But what you're doing is planting something in their DNA which will develop over a period of time. And he will look back and say, that was the right attitude. Mm -hmm. Now, 
we live in a world really where people don't like losers anymore. But unfortunately, we also live in a world where excellence is rewarded. So it depends what we want to be. You know, I want to put, listen, I want to put a cotton ball around my grandchildren, but I can't. You know, I can't. Mm -hmm. And they, I know they're going to be spoiled in comparison. They're going to have things and they, I'm trying now with my 13 year old who is a gorgeous, gorgeous girl. I'm trying now to get her to understand the real world. Yeah. You know, that she's got to survive on her own money. She's not allowed. And it's difficult. <laughs> but you know that what you're doing is you're just planting a little bit of you in that child. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the DNA is strong enough to take that seed and grow it into this enormous flower. Eddie, look, Eddie was a, a pain in the neck. <laughs> At 16, he was the, just like the kids that I used to beat up playing football because they was from a posh school. Yeah, he yeah. was that kid, yeah, yeah. which is why I took him in the gym when he was 16 and I was 47, and we had a proper fight. I heard about fight. this. Is it, what, what led to that? Was it because he wanted to fight? He no, to I was just fed up with him. <laughs> I was to come home and like... He would get into trouble at school and he was a big lump, you know, and yeah. he was at Billy Ricky Boxing Club. He had a four fight, something like that. He could, he could handle himself, but he was 16 years old, but he was a big lump. I just, I said to my wife, I'm, I'm not sure this is what I want to bring up. This is everything I've gone against. Mm -hmm. Rich people who have been spoiled by their mum and dad and expect everything to be on a plate for them. I don't think the world's not like that. Yeah. Maybe it is, maybe I'm wrong. But I just said to him one day, he got in some trouble with having a fight with somebody. And I said, listen, you think you're a tough guy. Get your gear. We'll go down to the gym in Romford and we'll have three rounds and we'll find out who really is the toughest. How did it go? I smacked him with a right hand that zanged up my, honestly, right, because he was dead up for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, 16. He's not frightened of anybody. I oh, 16. Sounds ridiculous. But yeah, yeah. Bear in mind that I was shit and he was much better anyway, technically. But. I hit him with a right hand that I swear should have knocked out anybody. <laughs> and he he took it. And I thought to myself then, I could have a bit of a problem here. <laughs> and he dropped me twice in the second round with body shots and we never had the third round. And I left that boxing ring over the moon. Happier. He's happy. Than I was. Because I found out I had a proper geezer as a son. Yeah. Not, not because he beat me up, because he showed character. Because mm -hmm. he showed that he could take a shot and give it back. Not say, because he was never any good. I mean, he, he packed up soon after, about 17 or 18, he packed up, mm. simply because he found out that a lot of kids were tougher than him. Yeah, yeah. And and in life, you have to find out the level you, it's not point, you don't spend your life living at a level that you're not capable of sustaining. You have to find your level. And then you have to try and be the best you can at that level. None of us are going to change the world. Mm -hmm. But we can... We can give our best, is all I ask. And that day in the ring, I realised that he was my son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was happy. I, I think, though, that the listening to everything now, you've got such a... And I'm guessing that's life experience, right? And yeah, being where you are now yeah. is an awesome I, place. I probably wouldn't have said a lot to you like this when I was 25. Yeah. When I'm 75, I've, I've made my mistakes. Mm -hmm. I've learned, I've done things that, you know, I'm not proud of. You know, I, I, I should have been at my son's birth. Mm-hmm. But in the mood I was at that time, I was going through my selfish patch of I've got to win every argument and training with my, or working out with my kids or whatever. I would give 100% because I wanted them to understand that do they, do they like losing? Because if they do, I'll beat them every day. And if I don't beat them every day, then they're going to settle for being confused as to their own ability. And when they do do something, they're going to feel a sense of pride in themselves that will take them to another level, not just in sport, in life. You know, Eddie, his work ethic, I thought I couldn't be beat. He's getting very close, if not being what are you, at my peak. At my peak, I was seven days a week, 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't come second. And if I did, I just tried extra hard the day after. Eddie's got that in him now, which makes him even more unbeatable. I mean, again, you're, we're all reliant on the talent we got, the TV contracts. It's all about money as well, isn't it? I mean, you know, we've got DAZN's money and, you know, that's why we left Sky. We mm -hmm. didn't leave Sky because we wanted to leave Sky. We left Sky 
because of, we found a broadcaster was going to give us X times more money and believed in what we wanted to do, which was big shows, competitive fights, pay people the proper money, but then expect let them expect to have a proper fight. Mm -hmm. There's too many fighters, you know, you sign a fighter, the first thing they see, if it's a big name, or oh, can I have an easy one back? No. No, you can't. You're a professional no. sportsman. You want a pile of money? You go and, you know, and if you're good enough, yes. If you're, if you're AJ, if you're Canelo, you, we, we, I work for you. Mm -hmm. But you've got to allow me to make a profit and you, you know, and you can get the rewards that you deserve. If, if the public want to see you, if the ratings justify that you're a big name, if the sign-ups, the subscribers improve because you're fighting, you deserve whatever you can get. So, Barrett, what for you has been... So I, I can hit, see that you, there's, there's a lot of positive attitudes and a lot of life experience, but what has been the worst day or the worst moment in boxing for you? Well, Michael Watson getting injured without a doubt. Of course. Because you have to take responsibility for that. Um, it wasn't my responsibility, ultimately, but it was because I was the promoter of the show. You know, If I hadn't promoted that show, he wouldn't have got injured. Michael's a friend, and, uh, and I, I, I admire him enormously, and he bears no remorse. I do, but that's you've got to live with that. And then on the flip side, best day. I think AJ against Klitschko. Oh man, what a night! But then again, I'd also have to say Eubank versus Ben, number one. Yeah, probably the best fight I've seen. Really, and that was a shit or bus fight. That's a roll of dice. Mm -hmm. You know, we pulled so many strokes to get that fight. And the other side pulled a lot of strokes on us. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the gladiators saw it out in the ring. So all the other shenanigans doesn't matter, does it? You've got to be able to fight. And that was a great fight. But AJ against Klitschko was his coming of age in terms of the resilience he showed. Hey, but, you know, people in this country write people off ever so quickly, don't they? You do a bad gig and say, oh, you're finished. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. you're blowing out your ass. you know, you're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> and you it's tell yourself, <laughs> yeah. but don't tell too many people. <laughs> but it gets you into shape, gets you fit. Yeah, yeah. You, because you're a winner. I'm, I'm only saying what you've epitomised yourself in your own life. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why are you who you are? You have to ask that sometimes. It's not... It's not worth asking it at your age because you're only a baby. As you get older, you have to be a bit more, have I put in enough? Have I done enough? Could I have done more? And those sort of questions are baffling even to me mm -hmm. because, of course, you could have done more. You could have been better. You could have made less mistakes. You could have trusted less people. But then you only deal the hand you're dealt with, don't you? Yeah. And when you get those cards, it's how you play them differentiates you from the norm. So, who's been your favorite in all the years that you you've been? Who's been your favorite fighter that you've worked with? <sighs> well, Eubank has to have that really because I needed a world champion. He was seven and zero, eight and zero. We ended up having twenty-one world title fights together. Wow! Um, we parted after he got beat to Steve Collins, a fight he should never have lost, but I hadn't realized at the time. The repercussions of the Watson injury on Eubank yeah. were fundamental. He was never the same fighter after that. But it's weird, really, because I was best man at his wedding and we were close. And then he's, you know, he is eccentric and he does drive you mad. And then he phoned me up about nine months ago. Weird. I don't know where he was. Somewhere in America, he went, Bather? Christopher? I said, Alan, you all right, mate? Yes. I've been thinking, all those years we had together, I thought it was just me. And I realise now, it was really just you, wasn't it? And I went, well, not really, mate. You was the one doing the fighting. Yes, I know that. But you were the one that made me. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Put the phone down. Really? And I thought, it's one of the loveliest phone calls I've ever had. Yeah. But... It left me quite confused, as he, <laughs> as he nearly always does. I won't have a bad word said against you, Ben. I mean, he is a nutcase sometimes, and he is eccentric. Mm -hmm. But I've never known him tell a lie. It's, in, it's weird, isn't it? And, yeah. and he's done things that most people wouldn't even know about that shows me he's a proper geezer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I suppose we all change as we get older, and, you know, but 
they were the best times because it was in the same way as me and Davis in the seventies were up against the world. Can you imagine that? You know, two council I'm not being two council house kids with nothing other than let's go out there and let's do it. Stick it right up, everybody. <laughs> and I've got the mouth and you've got the ability mm -hmm. and we're gonna make a lot of money together. And then the same feeling, very close, was with me and Eubank. I needed a world champion, you know. Other promoters were much bigger than me. And let's go out, I mean, let's go out there and do it. Because we're only limited by our own imagination. Mm -hmm. So we've got an opportunity. All I ask in life and all I try to do in life is all about opportunity. Give me an opportunity. And I look at my sportsmen and women, thousands and thousands of them all around the world, whether they're playing nine ball pool or whether they're temping bowling or wherever they are. So let me give you an opportunity. I can't help you to win. If you're the best darts player in the world, go and show me. I can't help you to win. My job is to give you the opportunity and that opportunity can, if you're good enough, change your life. But don't come to me crying if you don't. Because yeah. it means you're not good enough. Look in the mirror, be a man. The man looks in the mirror at himself and says, boy, I weren't good enough. With me and boxing, I would have loved to have been a champion. Mm -hmm. I was useless. <laughs> but I looked in the mirror and said to myself, do you know what, Baz? You just ain't good enough, boy. And that's okay. Because then you move on to something else and hopefully you find something. I became the best and to this day remain the best sports promoter in the world. And on that note, Barry. Well, that's a great way to finish. That is a mic drop moment right there, Barry. Thank you so much for being on A Fighter's Life. It's an absolute pleasure, pal.